say, the next round of foreclosures uh, to address the potential for an increase in crime rate in those affected cities or communities. What are we doing about that? Is that what, what can we do? I mean, if we, if we know the relationship, uh, and we know the pattern, and we know that it is another wave is, is, is going to come, what can we do? Yeah, it's a great um, point. What can we do is a difficult question because in some ways the research is still so at such an early stage. It's hard to say. Uh, something I mentioned before, one challenge for this um, is, is, is the large scale. So you might think, oh, you know, what would happen to a particular neighborhood? They get hit by foreclosures. What, you know, maybe people leave, that sort of thing. And we have a bit of an understanding about that. But what happens if all the neighborhoods get hit? You know, is it the same process? Do people have the same choices? Do they respond in the same way? Um, this research that I showed you tonight was is very early, very preliminary work, very sort of off the desk, if you will, sort of thing. So what answers are there? Um, we're not ready yet for those. That's part of why, in some ways, there's people kind of scrambling to study this. There's, you know, National Institute of Justice has a call out right now for uh, researchers studying this very issue because we don't have answers. I mean, it's a great point. Um, we're trying to scramble, trying to get a better understanding of how it plays out. My, how it links into my work is to say that there's a lot of ways it probably does. And it's not enough to simply come in and, and look at a, a single neighborhood, look at foreclosures, and say that's the end of the story. That's much bigger than that. Um, but as to what the actual answer is, that's been, it, I don't have one at this point. I have another question for John. Um, did I get it right that you said that as vacancies go up, violent crime um, goes up, but property crime does not? Uh, yes, I'm sorry. Yeah. All right, so yeah, I'm trying to figure out why that's so. So it, it seems like if you have a lot of houses around that are empty, that it seems like you could lure people who want to squat in houses or do other kinds of property crime because people aren't there watching it. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, it, it's challenging when I mean, you see these patterns and say, okay, why does it happen? That, that there, it, it's a challenge to understand why that might be the case. Um, property crime, in part, when you have a lot of foreclosures, now there's a lot of empty houses. So what property crime? You might get vandalism and that sort of thing, but you're not going to get many burglaries if houses are sitting empty, for instance, as one way to think about it. What you do see, I mean, you, you uh, describe it much better than I had no time, I guess, to describe it, but that is the process, right? What happens? People squat. We start, we saw this huge increase in drug crime, Well, that's probably not surprising given what you described, right? That's the sort of thing that happens to these um, places. They become havens for that. They become um, havens for other types of violent crime. Property crime, a little less so. There's less reason. I mean, you would think, some have argued that it would, um, you'd see an increase in property crime for the reasons you described. Others say, um, no, you'd see a decrease because there's just less to steal at that point. Um, but the evidence here was at least, of course, that was evidence from one city. And it, so take it as far as you can take it, but it, it wasn't evidence there. You talked about um, the students that you work with and giving them the opportunity to learn globally. Um, a big question for me, I, since a lot of the work at the Community Outreach Partnership Center does is local and regional um, here in Southern California, I wondered if you might um, be able to share with us um, how students who go out into the world and learn globally might be able to take some of the lessons that they learn and apply them to similar situations here um, in Southern California. Or that isn't something that I've focused a lot on. Um, we have sent students out to places like Uganda, Peru, Sudan, Afghanistan, and so on. Some of them have worked on issues like disaster response and been able to look at how disasters are handled in other parts of the world. Um, often where they have a lot of experience with this and, and are able to, to you know, bring things back to, to where they were before the disaster more quickly than, than it appears that we're able to. I think that the, that the, the objective is to try and, and encourage students to acquire a level of global proficiency so that when they come back and learn what they do, they have a slightly richer understanding of some of the constraints that are at work out there. Um, that they don't simplify the challenges that other, other places are facing. But they have a deeper understanding of what the rest of the world, we tend to see our problems as, as complicated, and then we tend to look at other countries and sort of, why don't you solve that? 
But when students get out there, they suddenly realize that everybody operates under constraints. And yet everybody also operates in a world with lots of different opportunities, lots of different connections. And so the hope is that they'll, they'll come back with some sensitivity about the rest of the world, but also see some opportunities where the things that they do here may be of value out there, and, 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 and the things that people are doing out there may be of value here. So I think the, the, the focus is on encouraging global proficiency and awareness. We have tended to be a country that, that hasn't ventured out into the world as much as, 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 as the case in other you know, uh, uh, great powers. And I think that that's, that's starting to change. Um, when we were preparing this, I read this stunning statistic that more children are affected by autism than diabetes, HIV, and cancer combined. Combined. And that was a stunning statistic. At the same time, I had a paper that Wendy had given me of hers to read, and I did read it on the way to China. <laughs> and you were basically showing that when you compared parental reports of features of childhood development, self-reports with what you could code on videos of live interaction, naturally occurring interaction, and in the video you showed those videos, you basically argue that there's considerable discordance, that what the parents see in, as the markers of childhood development are somewhat at odds with what you and your research team could see as you code these things objectively. Uh, that struck me as stunning if you think about the role parents play in helping their children get uh, acclimated uh, facilities, services, dealing with all the service providers. And I wonder if you could just speak about that finding in particular. I don't mean to put you on the spot. I know it wasn't the centerpiece of your video, but it, it told me That's we've fine. got a real problem. Well, I think you're right, because parents really are the gatekeepers of information. They're the ones who are going to decide you know, that they see a problem at home and that they should take that problem, share it with a uh, health service provider, you know, share it with the family, the a pediatrician, share it with a preschool teacher, share it with the school system, with the principal. So parents are the gatekeepers of information. So I think the solution, Val is correct, our research does show that parents are only moderately, parent reports about whether children, say, had language when they were one or two years of age and then lost it, or whether children were developing typically in terms of making eye contact or using gestures to communicate, these kinds of things. When the parents report, whether the child had these kinds of skills and lost those skills or had the skills and maintained them or lost the skills and then got them back, we have videotapes of the kids so we can see whether or not the children are showing these behaviors and we have very in very detailed ways looked at the correspondence between what's on the tape and what the parent reports. And the net result was moderate correspondence. Well, moderate's not good enough when you're dealing with a problem like this that's so pervasive, so either under-detecting it, failing to report, failing to notice a problem that's there, or over-reporting um, in order to get services for a child who maybe, like, doesn't, maybe doesn't meet the qualification for autism, but you know your child's not quite um, functioning up to par, or as Garrison Keeler would say, you're not your above average child. Um, so you want to get those extra services from the school district for your child. And so you know, parents need to maybe over-reporting autism in, in those instances. So we need to I think, take a two-pronged approach. One of the uh, ways we can deal with this is to inform parents, make them better observers of their children. And the uh, uh, online training program that I alluded to on the tape that Kara Thorson, my graduate student here, is developing is a way of getting parents to, uh, a six-month-old, to recognize what is typical development and what is atypical development. And we're particularly concerned about parents who already have a child with autism because of the genetic uh, underpinnings of, of the disorder, those parents do have a higher risk of having their subsequent children have autism. So that's a high risk group that needs to be alerted to the signs of what to look for in their subsequent children. So making parents better observers is one way to go. And then the other approach is to supplement parent reports. We have to do what we can do to help cue better recall from parents so that we can maybe, you know, say, think about the last time you went on summer vacation and ask about what the child did, or at you know, Christmas last year, at the child's birthday party, what happened. Maybe take certain events to help cue more accurate recall. And also, if when time permits, have um, pediatricians or school personnel actually observe the child so that we can supplement parent report with some observational data as well. Thank you, Wendy.
There's a, so many questions connected to all of this research, but I'm cognizant of the time, so I think I will thank all of the faculty that represented social ecology tonight to display how we discover, engage, and transform. I appreciate it immensely. Thank you.